Welcome to the Lead at the Top of Your Game podcast, where we equipped you to more effectively lead your seat at any employer, business, or industry in which you choose to play. Each week, we help you sharpen your leadership acumen by cracking open the playbooks of dynamic leaders who are doing big things in their professional endeavors. And now your host, leadership tactics and organizational development expert, Karen Farrell-Rhodes. Hey there, superstars, this is Karen, and thanks for joining another episode designed to help you better lead at the top of your game. Now, as you know, for season three, each month we're featuring leaders who have interesting roles in a particular profession or industry. And today's episode is part of our special series that's featuring the perspectives of leadership coaches who focus on a particular angle of leadership. And on today's show, we're featuring an expert who helps leaders use story narratives to up-level individual and team performance. We're honored to have Javon Wooden, founder of Bright Mind Consulting Group. And Javon is the epitome of a voracious learner uh, who uses his new experiences to open doors which may not have ever been obvious before. He's used his military background in tech to launch a pursuit of both MBA and a master's degree in cybersecurity. And then he also nurtured his fascination about the power of leadership when he started his firm, uh, Bright Mind Consulting Group. And in my opinion, their differentiating advantage is their ability to take a step back from the data and analytics that one is involved in at companies in order to more effectively figure out the root causes of problems. And then he uses leadership approaches to discover the most viable solutions for his clients. And, you know, his abilities are just off the charts. Now, in particular, I want you to listen deeply to his entry into our leadership playbook, where he shares his model on how to best use storytelling narratives to inspire and influence others to take action. Now, also remember to stay tuned for just two minutes after the episode to listen to my closing segment called Karen's Take, where I share a tip on how to use insights from today's episode to further sharpen your leadership acumen. And now, enjoy the show. Hey there, superstars. This is Karen, and welcome to another episode of the Lead at the Top of Your Game podcast. You know, one of the important aspects of leadership is building a narrative that others can understand your story, what you're trying to do, and that is inspirational in a way that will compel them to follow you. And I am just tickled pink to have on today's show a guest that's going to give us some insights on that and how how to do it. As you know, we're all about leadership execution and really understanding what leadership in action truly means. So uh, this individual has a framework, has done a lot of thought leadership in this space, and I'm super honored to have him as our guest on today's show. So we're so pleased to have Javon Wooden. He's the founder of Bright Mind Consulting Group, and he has done you know more in just a few years than most of us do in a lifetime. But I'm honored to share that he has an MBA and a master's degree in cybersecurity. But he was also a service for 12 years. We truly thank him for our service. Uh, but he used both his education, his experience in the military, and a lot of the resources to hone his expertise in all aspects of leadership and peak performance under the highest possible stakes. And we all know when you're leading at the top of your game, usually there's high stakes involved. So Without further ado, let's formally welcome Javon Wooden to the podcast. Welcome, Javon. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here, Karen. Thanks for having me, and I'm excited for this conversation. Oh, I am too. I am too. Now, before we dive into all of that introduction, which is quite quite meaty, if I do say so myself, we'd love to give you just a little time to share a small bit about you. So as for as much as you feel comfortable, would you give okay. us a sneak peek into maybe your personal life and passions? Absolutely. Grew up in Rochester, New York. I'm the middle child of five. These days, what I love to do when I'm not working, which uh, you know I try to get a lot of that time, um, is spend time with my family. Um, I have a lovely fiance. We're getting married in September. Not sure when this will drop. September is our date. We also have a little bundle of joy. 
<laughs> Thank you. We have a bundle of joy coming. Her name is Javon. Uh, so I'll have her as well. And then my dog. My dog's name is Hachi. He's a Shiba Inu. That's it's my fur baby. So I just like to spend time with them. I love the travel. You know, try to get out of this, this you know, the States as much as possible and experience yeah. different cultures, especially through food. And that's me in a nutshell. Oh my gosh. I think we're a sister and brother from another mother. I can just say ditto <laughs> and keep it going for them. Not getting married, already married. Got that one. Yeah, yeah. You but the dog and the passions and the travel, we're right there. <laughs> That's awesome. Hey, I love it. I think everyone should experience that, you know, some, some travel in their life for sure. Oh, absolutely. I have traveled to over 35 countries and but have tons more to go to experience. But I'm like you, I'd like to get past the touristy areas. I mean, I like them too, but to pass the touristy areas to really dive deep in the cultures and right. learn more about people. And I think you probably can agree that we're more alike than different all over the world. For sure. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's the beauty of it. You know, you get to you see, see that? that the differences aren't so different, right? Yes. I mean, it's still amazing that, you know, I spent uh, about two and a half weeks in Beijing uh, before the pandemic. Only knew maybe two words of Mandarin <laughs> and was able to go all over, you know, Beijing, even in the, um, in the remote areas and still be able to communicate. So that Absolutely. is a high five to verbal communications because we find a way to communicate very easy. So 100%. I mean, most of our <laughs> communication is nonverbal anyway. So. It is. It definitely is. And it's amazing what you understand if you just active listen, right. And watch Absolutely. gestures and things like that. Absolutely. Okay. Well, enough about my passport dreams. <laughs> Let us really dive into some of your areas of expertise, but let's start with your education because you had a mix. I think if I read it correctly, you have two master's degrees, an MBA and a master's that's in cyber right. security, or maybe that's all in one, but you combine no, that two different, ones. two different ones. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear a little bit of the story about how you started there. And then how did you combine, you know, your experience in the military to really double down on being an advocate for strong leadership? Absolutely. That's, that's a great question. So for me, I've always been inquisitive. So I'm a lifelong learner. Um, actually going back to school for my doctorate in business administration now, currently at the University of Houston. So I just feel like learning is something that we, we can never stop and you never know enough uh, for me personally. So background in tech came from the military. I was an information technology specialist, but I learned so much more um, that I wanted to see, um, which was in business and leadership. Um, so I went and I pursued my, my MBA, which gave me the, the theoretical aspect on top of what I already knew from being in that field. Um, so I just wanted to understand where some of the techniques and tactics came from. So it just gave me that perspective. Um, so now fast forward, I intertwine all of my experiences together because as a cybersecurity expert, you're very analytical. You're not looking at how things work, but how you can break it. Um, and that's what I do with a lot of my clients is when I do process improvement, um, I look at what is actually broken here or where is the weak link in their funnel, their processes, in their uh, profit pipeline and all the other stuff. Um, and that's why I come in and that's what makes me good at what I do is because I look at it from that perspective where I like, okay, I see why you made that decision, but I also could see why there's an issue, right? Um, so that's that's why I just enjoy, you know, combining the two worlds, so to speak. Um, and I can definitely understand how your expertise in cybersecurity can easily, those skill sets can easily transfer to leadership. Because, you know, I was uh, worked at Microsoft for almost 14 years and we had cybersecurity divisions before it was mainstream, a mainstream term. Right. But that analytical, strategic thinking trying to break things and find the weaknesses is are definitely skill sets and aspects you have to have to be a strong leader too. You have to understand in any leadership effort or initiative where the weak spots are, the vulnerabilities, bringing a team along to, you know, correct and address them um, and then stay on track for whatever it is you're trying to lead. And we won't even talk about the 50 billion books on leadership of the, you know, theories and support ideas to do all that oh, work. Yeah. Right. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> a never ending stream of that for sure. Never ending, never <laughs> ending. Oh, that is amazing. So let's move to you discussing a little bit more about the importance of 
the power of narrative when you're trying to lead or inspire or influence others. Uh, tell me more about your, you know, approach and thinking and framework that you have for that. Absolutely. So for me, storytelling is everything. I always say that, you know, stats tell, but stories sell, right? And as humans, not even as leaders alone, we're always selling something, whether we're selling our ideas, we're selling ourselves to our spouses, our friends, our significant others, you know, we're selling other companies, whatever the case may be, we're always selling. And the best way to do that is by connecting, right? Um, So I like to say that uh, we are using narrative to inspire and influence because when you tell a story, you know, to support your point, it gets that emotional, forges that emotional connection with people. And that brings them in, gets them interested. And this whole framework really came about by Maya Angelou's quote, right? Where she says, people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. That's right. And when I dove deeper into that and really dissected it and thought about it, thinking about some of the leaders that we know today, you know, Elon Musk, you think about him, whether you love him or you don't like him at all, you know, he uses stories beautifully. He does. Uh, when he launched, uh, you know, the, the the rocket into space the first time, he said, whether it's a success or other thing blows up, it's going to be a beautiful show either way. Right. So he's able to use that humor and tie it in together to make people want to see a spectacle, regardless, you know. If you think about uh, Mac, when he, when uh, Steve Jobs sold the Mac, the company was doing terribly. Right? They were poor. Steve Jobs got fired. He got kicked out of his own yeah. company, right? Because they were right. doing so poorly. And a lot of people don't know this is he had to go to Microsoft to get help, right? To get a loan so they can buy some stocks and shares in the Apple. But that story, when he came back, is what I wanted to focus on here. When he came back and the Mac became their number one product, he didn't talk about the specs, right? We all know computers have this RAM and all this. No one understands that. They understand stories. So he gave the Mac a friendly face. He talked about the curves. He talked about the, the vibrant colors and how it made you feel. He talked about all of those things. And that's why I focus on the power of using narratives as you lead teams. Because if I can find a story that resonates, that evokes emotion, whether it's me wanting them to hit a deadline or it's me wanting them to think outside the box to innovate, I always have something I can lean on, whether it's my story or a story of someone who's led the path before us. Um, so that's why where all of this came from. It's really forging those emotional connections, leveraging them to be a force multiplier when it comes to you getting things done. Love that. And you're absolutely right, because if you cannot make a connection with the story that you're making, you're not going to earn the right to be heard by whoever it is you're trying right. to influence, right? And um, that's one of the things that um, we too try to emphasize to our clients is that you need to tell the story in the perspective of who it is you're trying to influence. We know that there's some big ideas that you have and you want to present them and bring them to the table, but you do need to put yourselves in their shoes and help them Mm -hmm. understand how they will be better off by following your lead or partnering with you or what have you. Because when it resonates with them, it makes everything so much more easy. And it sounds like you do the same thing when you're consulting. Absolutely. I think it's a necessity because if you don't do that, you're going to sound the same as everyone else. You're going to fall on deaf ears, right? And then um, when it comes to being a leader, right, people are so inundated with their own thoughts and and external factors that you have to have something that tunes them back in. That's Um, right. And that's where the stories become uh, uh, an important aspect of that. And the first step to any of this, the first step in the framework is to identify the goal. You know, why are you telling this story? Because it has to be in alignment, like you said, with the people you're speaking to. So you have to know your audience and identify the goal um, because you can't just bring something out, you know, from nowhere. And they're like, what are you talking about? Exactly. Right. (laughs) (laughs) It happens, you know, it definitely happens. More than we like to admit. Yes. (laughs) You're so right. Sure. All right. Well, the first step that led us into the first step, identify the goal. Okay. What's the second step? That's the forge the emotional connections. So you you have to forge emotional connections or else everything else is just going to fall by the wayside. And then what you want to do when it comes to um, after you forge those emotional connections is you want to make sure it's succinct and pointed. Right. You want to make sure you're expressing what the point of that story is and keep it short. Keep it simple. Don't start going on a tangent, making it elaborate. Make sure it's of the language 
of your audience, right? So as a speaker, we, we're told, like, keep it at a certain grade level, right? Whether that's ninth grade or sixth grade, whatever you want to do. You I don't want to use grade. too much jargon. Third grade is that? I think that's a little too low for me. <laughs> I don't even know what third grade language sounds like. But, yeah. but you want to avoid technical jargon, really. Like even if you're speaking to a group of, of scientists, they know that stuff. They're experts in that. They don't need to hear all of that stuff. So you want to make sure you use layman's terms, keep it simple, keep it plain. And then you want to keep it, you want to make sure it's succinct, right? Um, you want to make sure you're not tailing off and making it too long. Because simple doesn't necessarily mean concise. Um, so you want to make sure it's uh, really concise to the point um, and you have a call to action in it. Make sure there's a call to action. Don't leave them hanging. Right. So if I take them down in the valley with a, with a sad story, I got to bring them back up and then I got to get them to the point where they're inspired, not motivated, because motivation is fleeting. Make them inspired to take action. Right. Um, so that's a big point for for leaders. And I know a lot of the audience is probably saying like, man, I, I, I suck at storytelling. What I say, especially to my audiences, I say, no, you don't. Because if you think about one of the first skills you learned, it was storytelling. Whether you were reading a book or your, your caregiver was reading a story to you or wanted you to read, it's always a story. That's right? Right. So we got to make sure we tap back into that, that childlike behavior and start just being free with it. Right? Identify, and I tell my clients, identify a couple of stories for certain situations. Right. If you see that you have a play, you need a playbook, just pick a couple of stories. If your team is naturally just unmotivated group, <laughs> pick some things that will inspire them to be, to ramp up. If your team is is not very cognizant or cohesive when they communicate, find a story that can tell them why it's important for them to collaborate on a level. Right. You know, it's just you have to apply it to that thing and then just give them an opportunity to also give you feedback. Right. So one of the most important things we can do to learn our audience is learn about them, right? Let them tell you stories because you have to listen too as a leader. So That's let right. learn stories on their end so you can learn what drives them, right? So if I know that someone is there, if I ask them just plainly, like, what makes you want to be in this position or in this role? Most people aren't going to say salary. They're not, no. they're not really, the money after a while goes away. That right. isn't their important job. Maybe they're there because they have a family they really want to take care of. You know, maybe they're there because they like to be challenged. You know, find that. And once you have that, now you can play the game. Right. Now you can use that in your storytelling. And you can I know I'm talking to someone whose family means everything. I can go ahead and mention that in my story. Like, man, you know what? I remember when I was overseas and one of my soldiers, they were underperforming. And I asked them, why did they choose? Why did they choose the military? at the threat of being away from their family or their loved ones and things they cared about for a year. And they told me because they weren't able to provide for their family and that was one of their biggest fears. So I leveraged my personal story to let them know that, hey, I was the same way. It got me into trouble at first because when I was 17, I thought the same thing and I ended up facing some jail time. Luckily, I didn't have to do that. But with the guidance and the ability to listen, I was able to find mentors who invested in me and made me believe that I can do more and be more. And that's when I started really taking action, right? So things like that, you just use that and spend it however you want to do. Uh, Toastmasters is a great organization to learn how to do that. But that's, that's what we have to do as leaders. You're so right. And I agree totally. I was a member for years for our local Toastmasters. Well, we have a million of them here in Atlanta, but one that was not too far <laughs> from the house. But and definitely, we'll say to those who are out there, it is definitely worth your time if you're going to do any kind of speaking engagements or you don't even if you have to do speaking engagements. If you ever have to present or convince or others, if you have to speak to others, you definitely should take uh, advantage of a Toastmasters because it will Absolutely. give you practice preparing for what you want to say, but then also thinking on the spot. And getting feedback in such a kind way that, to improve your um, storytelling, it's invaluable. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So kudos. Absolutely. I mean, you, I'm sorry. I was going to say, you think about like as executives, right? As executive leaders, when you're in that boardroom, um, and this is a point uh, that a lot of my clients, they want me to train them on their speaking because of this. So in the boardroom, they have a presentation. You have all this data not that no one really cares about, right? It just looks good. Yeah. Uh, and there, there's a point where people start to glaze over. They're like, okay, this is a lot. So at what point can you add that story in? And I venture to say that if you take that presentation, 
and make it a cohesive story, people are more likely to get some of that data out of that, right? Yeah. Get the, the real points, not the data, not the numbers that they probably don't even really care about, but the point, right? The premise of it. What action do they need to take? Because that's really what they need. They want to think about. That's right. You know, what? How does this tie in to me? How is it relevant to me? What I need to and that's the points we need to get to in our stories. That's right. In my experience, you really want to leave them so interested that they're asking you more. You're just laying Absolutely. out enough story to check and see if this is grabbing them, if it's resonating with them. You know, instead of rattling off 50 facts, maybe it's one yes. significant one that, that will wow them. Or, a, or to your point, a story about, you know, an improvement or something that somebody went through it and ended up being in a better situation, something that will catch their attention that means a lot to them where they'll mm-hmm. say, Hey, Javon, you know, gosh, that something we're dealing with every day, you know, tell me more about that. Cause that's right. when you uh, can extend and relate. That's when you start deepening those relationships and those conversations and it right. builds up that no like, and trust factor, you know, that's so important when you're, Absolutely. Trying to be a strong leader. Absolutely. You're correct. I mean, like I said, listening is a part of storytelling, right? Absolutely. Um, it's like, you know, you want them to be asking you questions. And I venture to say that if you really want to take it to the next level, if possible, you should be having them be very engaged, right? Ask them questions, you know, ask them thoughts so they can start feeling like, oh man, this is, this is fun. This is important. I'm, I'm here, you know, I'm getting to say what's on my chest type of thing. That's right. um, and then you'll, you'll be surprised what you get out of that, you know, how people feel energized and pay attention to body language when you're when you're doing this. Right? Absolutely. Like, see what people are doing, see who's nodding, see who's like reaching for their phones, you know, check that, that all out. And, and, you know, that way you get a sense, a, a feel, climate survey, as we say, real quick, you know, just check in the temperature of the room, see if it's hitting, see if it's landing with the people you need it to land for. Not everyone is yeah. going to like it, but. People you really need and you're targeting. That's who you want to pay attention to. That's absolutely. And then the fifth one is just to, to practice, right? The fifth uh, part of the framework is yeah. to practice. Because like I said, we whether you think you're a storyteller or not, you are and you need to be. <laughs> that's right. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You have to be because that's the only way you're going to persuade and dissuade, right? Anybody, um, yeah. People to start resonating. Exactly. So Javon, would you mind just running through the topics really quick, the five again, just so people can make sure they have their notes correct? Absolutely. So first is identify the goal, right? Who are you talking to and and all that stuff. The second one is forge emotional connections, right? The third one is keep it simple. Keep it layman's terms. Don't use a lot of technical jargon. The fourth one is make it concise, but point it, right? Um, and within that is the the sub four of, you know, make sure you're listening and, and identifying the, the points that they need. Um, and the fifth one is to, to practice and take action, right? You don't have to be perfect with this, but the, the effort that you put in is going to pay dividends. That was just pure gold right there. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not going to let you go yet. I still have a few more minutes to ask That's you a few more questions, but that was gold. Right, I, you know, I love the talk, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> you and me both. You and me both, my dear. Well, you know, it, it, it's no surprise that um, that you had selected. You know, we always love to ask our guests which of the leadership t- execution tactics that came out of our research resonated with them, and it's no surprise hearing your story and what you've talked about that you selected leading with executive presence, which was one that kind of resonated with you. And for my new listeners out there who may not be as familiar, it, leading with executive presence is a big umbrella of an uh, activity. But the way we define it is making clear and convincing either oral or written presentations on your perspectives in a way that helps to influence others to follow your lead. And so, Javon, I was just curious for you, you know, we can always talk about grit and charisma and all those other things that fall in uh, emotional intelligence, all that that falls under executive presence. But I was just curious why leading with executive presence really resonated with you as a critical behavior tactic that leaders have to be skilled in. Absolutely. And this resonates with me because I understand the the criticality of if it's not there, if you don't have an executive presence um, leading you. So one, uh, that executive presence, representation matters. Right? We hear it all the time. So if you see someone 
who is inspiring you or is who is making you a better person who is challenging you. To me, that's what the executive presence does. It forces people to be better, right? It, it allows them to feel more confident as well. If they see you exuding confidence and they see you leading and owning when you make your mistakes, uh, then they will do the same thing. And that's a cultural thing. And I feel like that culture starts with that leader. And I want to make a distinction for people that executive presence, it doesn't have to be that you are in the top of an organization. That should be something that you really embody in your life. It's a lifestyle thing. And that's why it resonates with me. When I'm walking, when I, as soon as I wake up, I have to decide to be in that mindset, right? Because I want to make that impact. And the executive presence is the only way I'm going to step into my power and my purpose and also allow others to do the same when they look at me. Love that. And so I'm curious, Siobhan, I mean, you're, you know, the head of your own consulting firm. Um, You've had a breadth of experiences. What have you found that it takes for you to lead at the top of your game? It takes humility (laughs) to to know when I don't know something, to know when I need assistance, to know when I need help, and to be able to say, hey, I don't know this. I I need you to find out or I need to find out and I need help. I need uh, to bring someone in or whatever the case may be, because without that, you're going to fall flat on your face. And I think that's a part of the executive presence is being able to say, hey, we need somebody or, hey, I don't know what I'm doing. Let's let's learn up or study up on that. Um, I think that's where a lot of people fail is being too too much bravado and too much arrogance, really, not even confidence, arrogance uh, to say that they they don't need anyone else because that's just not the case. I mean, if you want to sustain success, you have to collaborate uh, versus compete. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I can't let you get out of here, Devon, without telling us a little bit more about your practice, what you do, like who's your target audience uh, so that people know, you know, how to, you know, find you and what you can do to support them. Absolutely. But then you've also have a book, you have a podcast, you're a man of many talents. So I want (laughs) to give you some space and grace to kind of share with some of that with us. So let's start out with your practice itself. Who is your target market? Is it more smaller businesses? Is it corporations? Is it a mix of both? And what do you do for them? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And thank you for providing this space for me, uh, Karen. So Brad Mind Consulting Group, we focus on service-based businesses. So that could be that small mom and pop all the way up to the Fortune 500 companies. So our focus is to increase clarity of business objectives, boost confidence in decision-making, and augment cash flow. We also offer uh, speaker training. So, and the reason why this all ties together is because it all leads to leaving that legacy. And that's the mission um, of Bright Mind at, at the end of the day. Wow. Wonderful. And the, your, you know what I love about that? Your ability to, to tie it into bottom line business metrics and people metrics is huge. So if you're able to go Thank in you. and help, you know, organizations within those areas, I'm sure it has a direct impact on you know, bringing in more revenue or clients are getting the word out about their businesses, I'm sure it has a, a real positive impact there. Thank you. Yeah. One, one of the things we find is that, um, you know, their personal and professional is directly correlated. Yes. Right. <laughs> you can't, it is. Like if your personal life is a mess, uh, it's, it's going to start impacting the business. It may take a little bit and then vice versa. If your business life is a mess, it's going to start impacting the personal. So we like to say we, we coach the people and consult the business. There you go. I love that. (laughs) Well, now let's move to your book. Can you tell us a little bit about your book and what's this about? Absolutely. So one of the the key components of all of this is mindset. So my book, Own Your Kingdom, How to Control Your Mindset So You Can Control Your Destiny, talks about how to overcome obstacles internally so that you can be your best self externally. Um, And I also have an upcoming book called The Five Whys. Um, So it's how a service-based business can focus on business growth without being overwhelmed. Um, And that's another framework that I have. Okay, I need Um, that one right now. Yeah. Yeah. So so I I felt that uh, there's a lot of books uh, saying the same thing, uh, you know, in different ways, but I didn't see a lot of books focus on service-based businesses. They're not. Um, So I wanted to write one. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's the next book that's upcoming. So working on that now. And yeah, I, I get you a copy when it, when it's all said and done. Hey, you got to let me know. I'll even get my copy. I just need to know Absolutely. some insights on that. I'm always in learning mode. <laughs> oh, yeah, I see. I see behind you. <laughs> That's evidence. Lot. A yeah, lot. I love that. 
Absolutely. Uh, and then also, can you share about your podcast? Yes. So the podcast is Design Your Life and Business, the podcast for leaders. You know, hence why I love talking about leadership. Like we, we focus on that. And it's really kind of tied to what I said before. So it's about designing a life and business you don't need a vacation from. And what that means is different for everyone else. So we have an array of guests, including you, yeah. um, who talk about <laughs> personal and professional development. So we talk about systems and processes. We've talked about AI. We talked about mindfulness-based stress reduction. We talk about everything that will make you better personally and professionally. So go ahead and follow that at theleaderspod.com. And we look forward to hearing your uh, your thoughts on it. That's right. So listeners, you know, you're already going to go ahead and subscribe to my podcast if you haven't already. So you, while you're there, just need to subscribe to theleaderspod.com as well, right? Yeah, podcast as well. And we're, you can find us, Design Life and Business, uh, the podcast for leaders on any platform. Nice. See, you get a two for one. Two great two for one episode uh, podcast series on leadership. So definitely take Absolutely. that into consideration. <laughs> and then last but not least, Javon, although we'll have all your information and links in the show notes, I always love to give you a chance to say in your own voice where folks can find you if they'd like to connect and learn more about your business, your book, your podcast and to reach you directly. Absolutely. So LinkedIn is my primary. So you can find me at uh, Javon Wooden. That's J-E-V-O-N-W-O-O-D-E-N. The same on Facebook. And then um, on uh, Instagram is Javon Speaks. So whichever one you prefer. All right. Well, it pains me to say that time is up, Javon, but this (laughs) has been such a fantastic episode. It was good. I just want to thank you on the from the bottom of my heart and on behalf of all our listeners for your gift of time and you sharing the framework and the stories and everything. Um, we really and truly appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure, Karen. Thank you so much for having me uh, and continue to do the uh, very needed work that you are doing um, and just let me know how I can be of service. We'll definitely do so. And thank you to listeners for joining another episode of the Lead at the Top of Your Game. As you know, we only ask that you uh, like and follow our podcast and share with just one friend, because by doing so, that helps us reach our, um, extend our reach and help others just like you to lead at the top of your game. Thanks so much again for listening and see you next week. Bye-bye. Well, I hope you enjoyed our conversation today with Javon Wooden, founder of Bright Mind Consulting Group. Links to his bio, his entry into our leadership playbook, and additional resources can be found in the show notes, both on your favorite podcast platform of choice and on the web at leadyourgamepodcast.com. And now for Karen's take on today's topic of influential narratives. Now, in addition to the great insights Javon shared with us, uh, I'd like to help you better understand the business case for using narratives when leading organizations and teams. First of all, leadership narratives add credibility. When leaders tell convincing and coherent stories, they are able to quickly establish credibility, relationships, and a sense of purposeful direction with those whom they seek to influence. Secondly, narratives are part of our human DNA. Narratives and stories are our natural medium of communication. Around 80% of our daily communications fall into the categories of storytelling, whether it be presentations, examples, anecdotes, or gossip. Did you know that the oldest written story is over 4,000 years old? And stories in the oral tradition, where they pass down information verbally, have been around for tens of thousands of years. Amazing, right? (laughs) Our third point is narratives help in managing change. For change to be effective, it has to happen simultaneously across three domains. What's going on with ourselves, what's going on with others, and what's going on in the environment of the cultures in which we operate. Narratives play a vital part in this. And people become empowered only when their stories are given credence and are rooted in reality. And then lastly, the contemporary research supports using narratives in leadership. There has been a huge amount of contemporary research, particularly in the areas of neuroscience, psychology, sociology, and anthropology, that points to using narratives as the simplest, the most effective, the most powerful, and the most memorable way to reach the hearts and minds of others. 
Human beings are hardwired for stories. And because they are multisensory, they stimulate and engage our ability to reason, our curiosity, and our energy in ways that other forms of communication cannot even begin to match. Timely, relevant, well-told narratives resonate in our minds and memories long after they were told. And they create emotional connections that give a visceral sense of what the future changes we are proposing might actually look and feel like. Basically, in a nutshell, they help us make sense of ourselves and our world. Well, that's all for today, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Please remember to subscribe to our podcast and share the podcast with just one friend because by doing so, you too will empower them to also lead at the top of their game. Thanks so much for listening and supporting the show and we'll see you next week. And that's our show for today. Thank you for listening to the Lead at the Top of Your Game podcast where we help you lead your seat at any employer, business, or industry in which you choose to play. You can check out the show notes, additional episodes, bonus resources, and also submit guest recommendations on our website at leadyourgamepodcast.com. You can follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn by searching for the name Karen Rhodes with Karen being spelled K-A-R-A-N. And if you like the show, the greatest gift you can give would be to subscribe and leave a rating on your podcast platform of choice. This podcast has been a production of Shockingly Different Leadership, a global consultancy which helps organizations execute their people, talent development, and organizational effectiveness initiatives on an on-demand project or contract basis. Huge thanks to our production and editing team for a job well done. Goodbye for now.